much. I appreciate that. Mic number three right here, mic number three, and it is good to be here this morning. If you'll turn me up just a little bit more, that would be great. want to make sure everybody's alive, awake, alert, and enthusiastic this morning. So make some noise if you're awake this morning. All right, just making sure. Your intensity and passion has just been so uh, encouraging. Uh, you traveled all that way. There were groups here from Alaska and uh, from somewhere and Texas and uh, Texas and New Mexico. I met some people from New Mexico and then, and then all, all the more local, but you still drove ways to get here all over California and this western region, if that's you. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I tell you what, this is like preaching at a, at a pastor's conference or to adults. You've just listened so well. And I, I was convicted and, and, and encouraged and challenged by the message, but, but also by, by you listening last night to Brother Cooper. And I just want to say thank you. This is, this, this is just an incredible group of young people, and I truly, truly appreciate the privilege of, of preaching here, and I'm grateful to be here. I want to tell you why I'm here this morning and why I'm preaching. You say, uh, Pastor Treber invited you. N not really. Pastor Treber listened to the Holy Spirit of God, and I believe the Holy Spirit of God has us for this moment, this message. Because I was up in a little chapel early in the morning, way up in Michigan, not long ago, and uh, I was getting ready to preach this one message. I wasn't the camp preacher, but Abdel Judah had me preach one morning to his teenagers there, way up in Michigan at a camp they rented. And I walked in to pray and to prepare uh, for that morning message, and I began to look at the walls, and on the walls they had what is called prayer hands. All the young people the night before on the opening night, Monday night, had taken a cut out of their hands and had written the burdens, the prayers, the story, whatever it is that they wanted somebody else to know or to pray about, and they had taped them on the walls. And then every service, the teenagers would go. They were anonymous. They didn't have their names written on the hands. They would go and place their hand on somebody else's hand, and they would pray. They would bear that one another's burdens. They would pray uh, for that other teenager. And I was just curious. I just was wondering, you know, what the different prayer requests were and burns were, and I began to, to read, and five minutes turned into 10, and 10 into 20, and man, I was just so broken, and this was church camp, but just so, so broken at what the devil is doing to our generation, and the stories represented on each hand, and I realized, again, just that every story mattered, and every burden was real, and, and every problem was something that was so weighty on a, on a teenager's heart that they were willing to write it on a hand, and and uh, I found myself on my knees. I didn't plan to. I didn't think about having a little prayer meeting about that right then and there. I was just driven to my knees, and I was bawling and crying. I mean, out loud. I was glad nobody was around. I would have probably been embarrassed. I was weeping and crying and broken. And I began to pray this right then and there. My family was up there with me. I have seven little children and, and a, a busy life, like, of course, many of you do. But I found myself praying this prayer. I said, God, these stories matter. These lives matter. And, and, and I want to pray on the devil's strays. I, I want to get to some young person that will give their ears. And God, if you will use me, please, Lord, give me a brokenness. Give me a love that cannot be derived from self and only given from God. Please, I beg of you, if you will use me, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll go wherever you lead me to go to help just one young person. It wasn't long after that prayer, I got up, dried my tears away. Brother Luke Flood called me and said, I want you to come out to Youth Conference 2022. And immediately, I might have shared that with you on the phone, immediately, immediately, I thought about that prayer that I prayed. And so, uh, your stories, your burdens, the, the, wherever you are, sitting in the back, the front, the balcony, from young to old, hold up your hands, would you? This morning, just hold up your hands. Come on, everybody do that. Uh, those hands right there represent a story. Those hands represent a life. Those hands represent a burden, a prayer request. And you can put them down. I, I care about you. Uh, I love you. And I know that these men do as well. I'm just so privileged to be preaching uh, with people who truly care. Uh, this isn't just something to do in the summer. Uh, this is a passion. It is a purpose. And to see Pastor Treber sitting on the floor in the ready room talking about the young people and how God is working their lives. And this young person grew up here, or that young person, and, and, and giving up his seat to the speakers and sitting on the floor in a, in a posture of humility uh, just brought again that great gratitude to my heart as a young person. I'm still a young person. 
Uh, and, and I hope that you see the same thing, that, that your life matters, and this conference is about God investing into your life. So that's why I'm here this morning, and I pray that you would uh, come along on this journey with us in the Word of God and let God speak uh, to your heart this morning. I love the theme, and I love the question, who is the Lord? And man, that's convicted me already. I walked up onto a porch on soul winning. I had a senior from our church, um, one of our senior boys getting ready to go off to college this fall. And we were knocking on doors. We walked up onto a porch just a week ago Thursday. And, and there was a man fixing a vacuum cleaner on his front porch. And we walked up to him and tried to make small talk. He wouldn't hardly look up. And so I told him we were there to talk about Jesus. And he looks up and he said, have you ever met him? Well, I could have said a lot because, you know, spiritually and, and biblically and, and salvation, but, but I knew what he was saying. You know, have you ever seen him? And matter of fact, he followed up with that. Uh, you know, I just looked at him. I said, well, let's talk about that. He, he interrupted me. He says, uh, have you ever seen him? He says, uh, you don't know that he exists. He was being very cynical. And, and in my heart, I just prayed. I said, Lord, please help me to help this man. He's going to die and go to hell because he don't know the Lord. Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? And I said, Lord, give me wisdom. And I looked at the vacuum cleaner that he was fixing, sweat, hot Saturday, uh, Thursday evening. And I said to him, I said, that vacuum cleaner that you're fixing there, I said, do you think somebody designed that? I said, do you think somebody had to make that or, or it just is? It's just an accident. There is no designer. There is no creator. There is no manual. There's, there's nothing there. Matter of fact, you're looking it up online trying to figure out what the designer said to fix that right now. That's what you're doing. He just looked up at me like, you're not supposed to say that. It's amazing how the devil blinds us, doesn't he, young people? How, how foolish. The Bible calls it the fool. The fool has said in his heart. It's amazing how foolish we become with this question, who is the Lord? I tapped the mailbox just there on his front porch with the trailer there. I said something as simple as this mailbox. You think somebody didn't design that, didn't plan that, didn't think about that, didn't create that? I said, that Toyota sitting out in your driveway right there. I said, what about that? You think somebody had to make that? I said, have you ever met them? Have you ever seen them? I said, what about this cell phone right here? These things are crazy what they can do. The smarts, the intellectual uh, uh, brains and power behind that is incredible. And then I grabbed the tree. It was hanging over his porch. And I said, just this one tree in nature is greater design than all of the things that I've already mentioned, much less you and I. He just looked at me and said, I'll be there on Sunday. <laughs> now he hasn't come yet. But he's trying to answer the question, who is the Lord? Who is the Lord? You ever think about your eyebrows? I mean, God put, how come they're not on the side of your face? God put them there to keep the sweat from going in your eye. You ever think about your eyeball or the nose hairs or the little hairs in your ear or a million things about your body that a designer, a creator, who is the Lord made? He formed us. He created us. He called us for a purpose. There is a God. He is the Lord, and we must obey his voice. I loved having the privilege of preaching to young people in Cairo, Egypt, right outside of Cairo, Egypt. And we got to go up in the great pyramids of Giza. And we're supposed to have great respect for the dead. We climbed a long ways. I thought I was going to die. I would have loved to see Brother Alvin going up that little hallway, uh, hands and knees, climbing up into the sarcophagi room uh, where the, the dead was to be laid. And this great, magnificent work. I mean, you know, just mind-blowing. And we got up in there, and we were supposed to be really quiet. You're not supposed to say anything to respect the dead. And we had a group of us, about 15 men, and we said, respect the dead. How about we sing about the living? And we could have probably got killed. It was so echoey in there. And if you're a singer, if you ever get in an echoey room like the shower or bathroom or wherever you are, I'm telling you what, even in places of public, if you can hold a half harmony note, you ought to just sing in those echoey places. And so we just real whispering and said, somebody give us a note. Where should we start? And we began to sing How Great Thou Art. And tour groups were gathering, listening to us in the top of the Great Pyramid in Chi outside of Cairo, Egypt, singing, Oh, Lord, my God. When I in awesome wonder, I think about that great pyramid that they think is so wonderful and so big, and it is, until you think about how big the earth is, how incredible nature is, and how large this earth is. And then you see the sun that brings us so much uh, warmth and, 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 and light, and you think about our entire earth, the whole earth, a million earths could fit inside of the sun. 
and into the observable uh, universe that they have seen, just one of the stars that they can observe, just one that they can see, five billion suns can fit inside of just one of the stars. That's how big God is. Hey, he's not limited to earth to come walk down here, uh, 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 live live down here. Uh, He is over all. Thank God he sent his son to walk down here and to taste death for every man. But God is so big, yet he's so small that he can speak to you this morning. And his presence is in the room. Could Could we just do that this morning? Could we stand and make a big choir and sing, How Great Thou Art? And maybe to somebody here in the room this morning, uh, you, need to, you need to have revival in your heart to say, man, the devil has been making me foolish and stupid and dumb that I've been asking that question, who is the Lord? I don't know the Lord. And putting my faith in everything and everybody else instead of the great Lord our God. Let's sing that together. Oh, Lord, my God. Sing it out really loud. When I Think about the words. I see the stars. Think about that star. I see the star. Beautiful. I hear the rolling thunder. Thy power through us. Sing to the Lord this morning. Then sing to the Lord. Read that to God. From the bottom of your heart, lift it up. Then sing. Sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Let's really lift it up and sing it out this morning. And when I
in the Bible. Several years ago, before most of you were even in the youth group, or maybe all of you, I preached the first half of this message. And it's taken me a while to get to part two. And when I come to part two of the message that the Lord has laid on my heart for each and every one of you, I hope I get a chance to talk to you and, and uh, learn your name. And if you have a special prayer request, I'd love to pray with you uh, for that, as, as I'm sure all the, all the leaders uh, will. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, we'll begin reading in verse number 5. Some texts just preach themselves. There's no commentary needed here. And they just will preach if we will allow them to preach. And so I wanted to preach to you as we read a few verses in 1 Corinthians and chapter number 10. We'll begin reading in verse number 5. The Bible says, But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. I want you to follow along as we read verse number 7. If I pause, I want, you, I want you to read the word out loud together. Neither be idolaters as some as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed. And fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for... All these happened unto them for... And they are written for our... And they are written for our... Upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my dearly, he's speaking to the beloved, he's speaking to the born again. He's speaking to you and I this morning, admonishing us, encouraging us, feeding us, challenging us, stirring us up to say, flee from idolatry. Not understanding and believing and seeking and opening your heart and surrendering to the answer to that question is, that question behind us, is idolatry. Notice verse number 7, verse number 7, the Bible says, don't be idolaters, turning away from the Lord, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat, to drink, and rose up to play. Who were these people that the Bible is talking about? For every New Testament truth to the believers today, you and I, and the believers in the New Testament, there is an Old Testament illustration and an Old Testament picture. We find that picture in Exodus chapter number 32, if you'll turn there quickly. And we'll remain the rest of this message in Exodus chapter 32. And we read the account that the scriptures are admonishing us with in 1 Corinthians 5. So we're turning to Exodus 32 to see what they are talking about. And we see the story that we just read about in verse number 7, that the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Verse number 1 of Exodus 32, if you're there, make some noise this morning. Say amen. amen. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods. You know what they were saying? Who is the Lord? Who is the Lord that brought us out of Egypt, that heard our cry? Who's the Lord that spared us from having our firstborn slaughtered? We heard the cries of our neighbors, but we were spared. Who is the Lord that Moses rose that rod to and we, the waters parted? Who is the Lord that's brought about so much miracles? He says, up make us gods because we don't have the answer to the question chiseled in stone behind us. Up make us gods for which will go before us. Shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the representative of God, the preacher, as for this Moses, he don't know much. Let's, we're not trying to be disrespectful, but we're going to disrespect him. The man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, the man that saved us, us second generation Christians, the preachers and the youth pastors that led us to Jesus, 
Let's disrespect them because we have a new way. We've got it figured out. The man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we, we, don't, we want not what has become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, and notice this, your sons and your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings. Oh, this is great. This is new. This is exciting. Which were in their ears, and they brought them unto Aaron, and he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, an altar, a sacred altar. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to this golden calf. Is that what the scriptures say, verse 5? Man, you're doing incredible. Following along, notice, he said it's a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow, and they offered burnt offerings. They had their church and put their Jesus on. And they brought peace offerings. And then the people sat down to eat and to drink and to rose up to play. Did God like that? Did we read about that in 1 Corinthians 5, written for you and I? That's the story. He quoted it in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse number 10, excuse me, and verse number 7. They made an altar. They had peace offerings. They, they brought these things and worshiped the Lord. And then they sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down. For thy people, which brought, thou brought us out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. I want to preach this morning on this thought. Who is the Lord? Who is the Lord? Somebody that we are just playing games with. Somebody that we are just play. He's a little toy, isn't he? He's an Amazon Prime two-day delivery that we just took out of the box for this conference. Who is the Lord? Somebody that we're just playing games with. Father, bless us, I pray. We love these young people. There are such good. Lord, there are young men in here on fire for God. Their heart is already burning. God, you stirred my heart last night. Lord, I shed tears. I love to see people getting saved last night. Thank you for a generation that's not playing games. God, stir our heart tonight and walk into every room, walk down the hallways and jiggle the doors of our heart to see a room that might be a playroom today. And God, do a work that only you can do. Hide us behind the cross. May they not even remember uh, the, 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 the names of those that preach, but may they remember the God that was preached. Bless us, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. It was a crucial time in the history of the children of Israel, just like it's a crucial time for you. And God's trying to get your attention this morning and pour out his love and his blessing and his goodness to you this morning. And he's, and he's trying to speak to you this morning. And he's, and he's looking at their future. And he's seeing the promised land, the, the milk and honey, and, and all of the blessings in the life of victory. And it was a crucial time for their generation to come and their children and their wives and their sons and their daughters and all the teenagers and the youth groups that were at the base of that mountain it was a crucial time in their history. And at that crucial pinnacle moment, they were playing games. Much could be said about this crucial time for you in 2022. Much could be said at the crossroads that many Christian young people stand at today. You get this one opportunity, this one conference, this one chance. You don't see next year. You don't know what tomorrow will hold. You don't know what next year will hold. You don't know what 2025 will hold or 2030 will hold. This is a crossroad. It is a moment. God is working. Moses is on the mountaintop. The word of God is being given. Given. And in that moment, they were playing games. They were not discerning to see what was happening around them. CNN put out an article not long ago that said, We are now living in the saddest generation of young people that has ever been alive. Our nation and our culture is upside down. And the greatest pandemic and the greatest darkness is being covered up. And, and we're talking about guns or we're talking about pride or we're talking about equality or we're talking about our feels and feeling good and, and, and our life and our way. And yet the media is covering up the suicide epidemic, the darkness, the depression that is coming to the lives of young people. And yet we as God's people that have been given so much are sitting around unaware, undiscerning, just selfishly looking. And I'm not saying that all of us are living that this moment, but prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. There is a moment in all of our hearts that if we're not careful, we walk into the playroom and we begin to play games with what God has given us. 
I just saw an interview of, 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 of middle to upper class teenagers. This isn't, I could show you things much worse than this, but just walking into a school and, and just asking the question about how they feel. Are they depressed? And this is like 99% of our young people in public schools, nice public schools, just like around here, nice wealthy people and, and good people. And, and, and here is what they said. Just take a moment and listen. When were you last depressed? Um, probably right now. Wow. Um, mm. Ooh. <sighs> that's a loaded question. When were you last depressed? My birthday. Why do you get depressed on your birthday? I didn't have a lot of friends. I just feel like I don't have a lot of friends. When were you last depressed? Yesterday. Yesterday. Or yesterday, I guess. What happened? Uh, I don't like the way I look. Like, I don't like my face, I guess. When were you last depressed? Two months ago. A couple weeks ago. A couple days ago. Last night. This morning. An hour ago. Right now? Right now. Right now. Do you talk to people about it? Um, not really. It's hard to admit that you're not okay. I just kind of get in my feels a bit. If I always felt, like, conscious about what I was doing, you just have no motivation. It's difficult to wake up in the morning. I sit in my room, and I only come out when I need to eat or go to the bathroom. Depression has its, like, waves. Sometimes they can be smaller, and sometimes they can be bigger. Sometimes it just happens. The days kind of blend together. There was, like, a huge just weight on you. And you feel like there's no way out. I ran away. When were you last depressed? When I got my heart broke through my breakup. It was just really hard to like feel this type of way for someone. I mean, this whole year's just been crap. I'm all alone, like it's not good for me. I'm really terrible. <laughs> my best friend got her very first boyfriend and she kind of went off with him and I just felt very abandoned. I lost a lot of friends. It's hard like when you have this whole support system and those people just kind of um, go on their own ways and everything. I don't think I've talked to them since two years ago. I don't know. Oh my gosh, I'm tearing up now. What would you want to say to that person? I, um, I mean, I miss having you as a friend. Yeah. I got bullied, and that really took a toll on me. I got jumped. It was just, it was a lot going on. You got what? Uh, jumped. It wasn't, like, it was pretty, like, why'd I have to go through that? But at the same time, like, stuff happens, <laughs> you know. When were you last depressed? Yesterday. When were you last depressed? Today. Got unlucky with the depression gene. I have bipolar. I do take antidepressants. Anti-anxiety anti anxiety medication. Do they help? I can't remember what it was like when I wasn't on them. I started taking them in sixth grade, but I think they do. The world of a difference from being just like hyper aware, stressing about everything to just feeling like I can like do normal day to day activities like everyone else. When you are feeling depressed, what do you do? Sit there and wallow in self pity. <laughs> Try and forget about it. Sleep. Netflix. Video games, honestly. I dance. Listening to music. And this generation does not know the Lord, has nobody to turn to, and yet God's people that have been given so much have the answer. We have the answer to that right there. And we had a young man come to our church by the name of Dave, and man, he didn't have the right Bible, he didn't have the right doctrine, he'd never been to a, an independent Baptist church and a preaching church, and he began to get on fire for God and realized because of his family, because of uh, his friends in public school that he had come out of, uh, that, that life was not a game, that this was serious. He was aware, he was Discerning. He was convicted from the Word of God, and, and he went out and began to knock on doors and get on a bus route and uh, found a young man by the name of Logan. Logan plays in our orchestra today. Logan is on fire for God, and Logan was one of these kids just like that. Uh, living a life of emptiness and loneliness. I'm going to play just a quick clip of his testimony. Go ahead. I'm grateful for soul winners. Brother Dave Harder came to my house one day about four or five years ago. Out of the blue, I had no idea he was even coming. And he just taught me everything I needed to know right there and then. Uh, gave me the gospel, uh, helped me through it all. Uh, and in the end, I got saved uh, there on my front porch. Now, there are many things to this. My family get uh, not really church goers ever. My mom used to go when she was real little and she didn't like it. She saved, but that's about it. And my dad, I'm not sure if he's ever even gone to a church, and it's just not good sometimes around my place. But I'm thankful for God that he was able to make a way for me to be able to get here through the bus, that I'd be able to still be coming and that I've made it this far. Just. I'm so thankful for everything he has done for me. I'm glad that Dave wasn't playing games. 
I'm glad that my dad, when he knocked on a door, my dad and I knocked on a door, and a shaggy-haired kid came to the door in a small little Iowa town. I'm glad that, that we weren't out there playing games that day when Trevor Meyer trusted Christ as his personal Savior. I'm glad that a bus worker wasn't playing games when they knocked on Brother Reyes' door, and Brother Reyes got saved and, and, and his, brought his family to church, and little Alyssa uh, grew up here and married Trevor. I think we got a picture of them right here in this auditorium uh, getting married, and Trevor was a bus worker on that same bus route that Logan was reached on. I'm glad that people weren't playing games when it came to the life that truly mattered. Where's Brother Bruce Robinson this morning? We had an impromptu prayer meeting at the hotel. Is he in here somewhere this morning, Bruce Robinson? If you are, run up here as fast as you can. He didn't know I was going to do this. And man, we shed tears and prayed. Come on up here as fast as you can. Run on up here if you will. And uh, he, he talked about being at this youth conference. He said his parents sent him on the bus. His mom sent him on the bus just to watch out for his sisters, just to take care of them. And he came to this youth conference and answered that question, who is the Lord, and got saved in the morning. And that night got called to preach. And it's been, what, 25, 27 years, and now has a group from several hours away here pouring into their life. It's not a game to Brother Bruce. I'm glad it wasn't a game to Pastor Treber all those years ago. I am a product of Pastor Swanson and my dad and these great men of God who was not playing this religious game of life when there was at a crucial moment, a crucial time in Christianity and in, and in God's people's lives. I'm glad they were not playing games. And you see a testimony of a man here this morning reaching more people because somebody wasn't playing games. Thank you, Brother Bruce. Get, let's give Bruce a, a big round of applause this morning. When I look at my children, I want you to see my seven children this morning, Aaron and Hannah and Lydia and Abigail and Rachel and Andrew and Samuel. When I look at them and I look at you, I'm not playing games this morning. Because I want them to be called to the mission field. And I want them to be called to preach. And I want them to walk in truth. I don't want them to, to, to grow up with a bunch of people that are forgetting who the Lord is. And what the Lord says. And going off into liberal leftist Christianity that will eventually lead that generation down the road. That will leave them constantly questioning who really is the Lord. And what is his word. And where is his word. And can I hold it in my hand. And can I know right from wrong. And when I'm preaching to you. And when these men are preaching to you. Show the picture back up there again if you will that's what we're thinking about that's what we're praying about my wife called me this morning text me this morning she says all of us me and the children we're praying for you this morning oh we're so thankful you have the opportunity to invest in the young people I care about you, and God cares about you, but God has a future and a calling and a purpose beyond just you and your feels and any kind of depression or darkness or sadness that comes your way. God wants you to get up and endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Why? Because this is a battlefield. It's not a game. And finding the battlefield, finding your calling, finding your purpose will give you what Joshua and what Caleb had when they went into the promised land. It'll give victory. It'll give blessing. It'll give a future beyond on what anything those that were playing games ever even dreamed of having. I'm glad they weren't playing games. Let me give you just a few thoughts out of Exodus 32 this morning. Number one, they were playing games with the goodness of God. They were playing games with the goodness of God. See, Moses is up on the mountain for two reasons. The first reason he's up there to get instructions about the sanctuary. That's the tabernacle. That's this God of the universe. 92 billion light years large, this universe. That God of the universe, the God who created the sun like it was nothing. The God who created the earth. The God who put the eyebrows where they are and the ears on the side of your head and the mouth in front. And Aren't you glad your toes don't have taste buds? Instead of your tongue, the God that made you, the God that loves you, the God that cares about you, the God that's doing all of this for you, God made you, God cared about you. He's up on the mountaintop saying, I want to come down and speak in a still small voice, in a sanctuary, a tabernacle. I want to come down. They need me. Their flesh, I pity them as a father. I love them, and, 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 and they're going to go wayward if, they, if, they, if, they don't, if I do not work in the way that God has planned from the foundation of the earth, and I'm going to give instruction to Moses, and I'm going to come down and meet with them. That's what, they were, that's what God was doing while they were playing. He was trying to meet with them. And somebody here this morning, and I'm glad you're here for the fun and games. I love it. And you're here for the food, man. California and food. Good night. 
And you might be here for the girl, or you might be here for the boy, or you might just be here because somebody made you to be here. But God is still trying to tabernacle with you. He's still trying to dwell. You might be playing games with him, but he's trying to speak to you. Secondly, he was up on the mountain. Moses was. God had called him up there, not just for the, 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 the sanctuary, but the statutes, the, the, the ten what? The ten commandments. Oh, yeah, you can't do this and you can't do that when it comes to Christianity. No, all of Christianity is an addition. It's not a subtraction. It's not a dark. That's why he said, don't be ashamed of the Lord. The way of the transgressor is hard. Choose your cost because you're buying a product. You want to buy what the devil has or you want to get what I have? All of those commandments, like thou shalt not steal. It wasn't taking something away. Oh, yeah, you can't steal. You can't rob a gas station. No, it was the gift of ownership. And every single one of those Ten Commandments were the same way. Thou shalt not kill. Why? So you don't have to be murdered. And so the one you love don't have to be murdered. And God was trying to give them so much blessing. And they were rejecting it. And he was not well pleased. Why? Because, here's what it said in 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. They were overthrown in the wilderness. They corrupted the goodness of God. And all that God was trying to give them, they were so blessed, and we are so blessed. Paul tells Timothy, that from a child that has known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise into salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Many people here in the room tonight have never considered for a moment what it's like to grow up in a home with drugs and liquor. There are people in the room here tonight uh, that, that have, have, have grown up in a home and you don't know what it's like to hear your mom scream as she's being beat across the room. You don't know what it's like to hide yourself at night so that you are protected so somebody doesn't drag you out of bed, young lady. There are people around the world that have never heard John 3.16. And you've heard it to where it's like the manna coming out of your mouth, you're sick of it. And you've forgotten who the who is behind the who is the Lord. There are people that have to grow up in homes where heresy is being preached to them. But they got to go to a priest and give confession. And young people understand authenticity. And this is why they're leaving the, quote, church or religion in droves. Because they know it's not true. And if they could come in here and sit, they would know the presence of God is working. They would know that there is truth. And yet we've been given so much of the goodness of God. That often we become as they were in the wilderness, eating so much, having so much. I mean, it's like a, a Christian Hollywood out here. The level of video, the level of skit. By the way, guys, this year off the charts. I mean, the food. I mean, the auditorium. Like, literally people, uh, 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 the upper 1.1.1.1% of people in Dubai who will die and go to hell because they don't have Jesus. Only that teeny tiny little sliver in, in, in cities like Dubai, in the Emirates, this opulent, wealthy city, gets to have some kind of meeting place like this. And yet we are the point zero 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 point zero 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 one percent of the upper echelon of blessed young people. Why? Because we're born again and we're given so much nice buses and cars and food and all of the opulence and the poshness of this society. And we look at these conferences and we have to choose. Do we want to go to this camp or do we want to go to this conference or do we want to go here or go there? And you might come from a teeny tiny small little church. Thank God for country churches. But you have a pastor who pr prays and prepares and studies. You have a youth pastor that's brought you here. You got somebody that has poured into your life. And they poured out and poured out and poured out and poured out. Somebody once asked me, why do you serve God? I said, because I have to. Now, don't get me wrong. I get to. I want to. I chose to. I thank God. But too much has been given to me to walk away. Too much has been given me to be snarky about it. Too much has been given me. I've got to be around the Larry Browns and the Jack Trevers. I know they're real. I know they care. I know they love. I know they don't just have an agenda to take my generation down the wrong road. They have an agenda from the Word of God, a calling to take us into the paths of righteousness, to keep us from broken hearts and broken homes and shattered dreams. I've been given too much. The difference between David and Joseph. David was given and given and given and given and given. And yet he sinned. He stole Bathsheba. And Nathan had to be told what Joseph already knew. David had to say, God gave you this and gave you this and gave you this and gave you this. And if that would have been too little, he would have given you such and such things. And yet you still, you still 
desecrated the name of the Lord and brought judgment upon your life and family. Joseph in the same situation with Potiphar probably trying to do, probably bathing herself or whatever, trying to get his attention. Joseph says, no, I will not do this thing. How can I? How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He says, God has had favor on my life. Read the passage sometime in Genesis. He said, I, I'm, I'm, I'm the first in the, in the home. I've got, the, my master has given me all things. He said, I am grateful. David saw the girl and, and Joseph saw the God. And how did he see the God in the text there? In the scriptures here, there you see that he saw the goodness of God. That even in bondage, even in bad days, even in darkness, God was still trying to dwell with him, sanctuary with him, speak to him, to him, give him his plan, his word, and his way. David was up there just playing games. Choose your product. Choose the end. Oh, there's pleasure in sin for a season, but when we rob, when we play with, when we uh, goof around, when we don't get serious about saying, okay, God, I surrender my heart. God, I surrender my ears. God, I surrender my feet. God, I surrender my soul. God, I'll get saved if I'm lost. God, I will surrender to that burning in my heart, and I'll say, Lord, I surrender to preach. God, I surrender to marry God's will for my life. What is God's will? It's just simply God's wants. What God wants for you is an expected end, a good life, a blessed life. So many people have to put up with the teaching of work salvation, no eternal security. They never hear the, the, the song, the B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. They never hear that Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. They'll never sit in a Sunday school class with teachers that love them. They'll never go to a senior camp, a teen camp. They'll never go to a good church, a youth activity, a missions trip. And yet I've missed out on the heartaches of living my life in sin. I've missed out on the sorrow of facing this world without him. I have no regrets for the things that I've missed because deep in my heart the truth was and is. Every day that I live, I thank God for what I have missed. You sit on these pews, you hear a thousand messages. It's just what you do. Take for granted the things that you never had to sacrifice for. I'm preaching with you. I'm a second generation, third generation. My children on my wife's side are seventh generation Christians. Now, I understand that each and every one of us have to trust Christ for ourselves, but I'm talking about growing up in a home that, that we've been given so much, and they were playing games with what God was trying to give them. I had fainted unless I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Each and every one of you in your heart right now needs to think of something that you're grateful for. Right now, do it. I'm grateful. How many of you are grateful for this conference? Don't raise your hand if you're not truly grateful in your heart by way of a commitment, by way of a thought and a, and, and, and a decision. I am grateful for this conference. Raise your hand. I am grateful for this conference. Start there. I'm grateful for salvation, that I don't have to die and go to hell. I'm grateful for a God that loves me, that I don't have to sit on the porch wondering, uh, uh, knowing that, that there is a vacuum cleaner maker, but not knowing the answer to the question that's behind us. Secondly and quickly, they were playing games with their future. They were playing games with their future. Notice verse 8 of Exodus chapter 32. The Bible says these people have, what's the, what's the word? What did they do to themselves? Verse 8, Exodus 32, say it out loud. Am I in the right spot? Exodus chapter 32 and verse number 8. The Bible says, uh, let, me, let me get to the right place. And the Bible says they corrupt, verse number 7. I'm sorry, told you the wrong verse. The Bible says that they have what themselves? The end of verse number 7. They have corrupted themselves. God was not pleased with them because they were overthrown in the wilderness. They took the word of God that God was giving and had given, and the way of God, the plan of God, and they corrupted it. They took something good and they desecrated it. And God has given us a heart for God, a, a mind to serve God. He's given us an opportunity to get to God. And yet we will take the devices, the golden earrings, if you will, the things that we like and see every day that please us, and we use them to corrupt ourselves. I mean, you take something as simple as, as, as a TikTok, and a 14-year-old boy gets on there not realizing that from the moment that they sign in, I mean, I'm thinking that it's, I know that it's satanic, of the algorithms that is created to know what kind of person, how old they are, is watching. And if they spend just a few seconds on a picture, oh, it's always something very simple, not shocking, uh, maybe just some girl that's just attractive. If they spend just two seconds, the next time they log in, there will be an un a, 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 a barrage of a feed coming at that little 14-year-old developing uh, mind of things that uh, cause them to, 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 to this euphoric feeling of being sucked in deeper and 
and deeper and deeper and deeper until we find that we have corrupted ourselves and our minds can't even lift up God and we can't have respect as a Christian and say God loves me and he cares about me and he forgives me and he does but we've entered so much into the path of Satan that we can't see the goodness of God. They corrupted themselves. And you're corrupting yourself in the backseat of a car, or that was in the olden days, now in, in the proverbial backseat of a car called a cell phone because God placed inside of every young lady, once you reach a certain age, to begin to prepare for marriage one day. And the joys of marriage and the future and the calling that God has. And the Bible says in the book of Genesis that God puts the desire for a wife or for a young lady to her husband. And there's a desire there. For the young lady, it's a desire to please. It's a desire to be accepted in beauty and in that that close relationship. And yet, when we don't answer the question, who is the Lord and what does he say? We begin to corrupt ourselves, not understanding because we're going our own way, following our own flesh. Not understanding that what God has placed in our heart, a desire to please for our husband, we began to do it to the first thing that will try to give us any attention. And trust me, there's always a ship that's sailing to Tarshish. There's always a lure from Satan. And so we take that picture of that tight shirt or or we come to youth group seeing how tight we can get our clothes and how much we can show ourselves. Hey, and let the old let the old people mock it online all day long when we preach about old fashioned standards. But they made fun of my daddy, Brother Cooper, when he was busting a television. And now the parents come in weeping and crying and saying, my son's a sodomite. What do we do? And my dad says, I love you. But I tried to tell you we're corrupting ourselves. And God placed that desire in you. And it's a good thing to want to please and to want to have a man say, you're pretty, you're beautiful, ooh, I like that. But he's designed it for his way and his word and his statutes on top of that mountain to say, do it according to the commandments of God and you'll have joy and you'll have a promised land. Young men, God brings you to a season, a stage in your life where your body begins to talk to you. And it begins to talk to your mind, and your mind begins to, Paul even called it burning. He begins to, to, to give you this, this, this desire in your heart. Why? So that you can be a, a daddy, a father, to draw you to your wife and enjoy what is holy and right and applauded and celebrated. And that's why we have a wedding with the white dress and a pastor and a parent's Why We want to imprint on your mind. Men get imprinted many times with the first thing they see sexually. And we want to imprint on your mind that it's good, it's holy, it's for life. Hey, thank God for that. But yet the devil uh, uh, introduces. He introduces the imagery world. He introduces the video game world. Oh, it's just shooting people up. God forbid that we laugh at calamity and that we dwell on that which is dark. But we don't realize even within that are sexual words and sexual innuendos and hidden images standing in the side. And while we're blowing somebody's brains up, we don't realize that, that the devil is playing on the desire that God placed in our body for our wife one day. And we look at the images and we scroll. I mean, there's more pornography and more darkness in just the fail videos that you watch on on, on Facebook Watch or on TikTok or on all the different devices out there, Instagram, more garbage. And we're corrupting ourselves and corrupting ourselves and corrupting ourselves until we can get to the place where we sit at a conference like this. I mean, the elite of the elite. I mean, the word of God is being preached. We're one Bible preachers. We're preaching the King James Bible. We're loving you. We're not trying to entertain. You, I could have preached a message all day long that would have made you come up to me and be like, oh, you're such a wonderful preacher and I love you. You loved us and you patted us on the back and you just said whatever we wanted to hear and you made Hollywood jokes and talked about oh, how wonderful culture was. Hey, we're not here for that. We've been given so much and yet we corrupt ourselves, corrupt ourselves, corrupt ourselves with sin until we get to the place where we come to a conference so strung out and dried out and we're like, yeah, who is the Lord? Who is the Lord? I'm in my feels a bit this morning. I'm depressed too. Man, we've been given so much. Begin to corrupt themselves with their future. God is calling a young person to surrender to ministry, to surrender to Bible college, to just surrender to sticking with this old book when the world changes, to doing right when the whole world changes, to saying, I'm going to get close to the men who have stood the test of time, and I'm going to listen to what they say. I'm going to be careful not to get online and see whatever the devil's trying to pump out to corrupt us, that when God's calling it sin in Exodus chapter 32 and verse 17 and 18, Aaron's just calling it mischief. It's not that big of a deal. It is a big deal. God loves you, and he's trying to call you. 
Don't corrupt your future, your calling. God has an incredible future for your life. They were also playing games with their father. In Exodus chapter number 32, we read it. They made a feast to the Lord. They worshiped the Lord. They made sacrifices and burnt offerings and peace offerings. And they said, these be thy gods. Oh, yeah, let's worship these gods. Really? Really? There is a father that loves you. But you're going to have to get quiet enough. Go into that closet and close that door, young lady. Listen to me, young person. To listen to Abba Father. Daddy, Daddy, you love me. Daddy, you care about me. There are young people in the room, you're going like this. I would love that relationship. I'd love to reach out, and I see you shaking your head. I'd love to reach out in the air, in the, in the hotel room, and, and act like you're trying to hold him. Say, I wish I could see you. You're my dad. You're my Abba father. You're, you're closed. You're the God of all, and yet you're, you're right here. I wish so bad I could feel you, but, but I faith you from your word. And, and you want so bad to, to have a dad, a father. Somebody to tell you, hey, don't go there. Don't do this. Hey, young people that don't have a daddy, they'll come into pastor's office and say, I wish, when they're older, I wish I had somebody that cared where I went and what I did. I wish they would have kept me from what has led me to a life of broken dreams. I wish somebody would have told me who was the Lord. Yet regardless who you are or where you live or what kind of home you're in, some little quiet teenager sitting here somewhere, you've got a daddy and he was up on the mountain for those people and they were down there saying, but, but, but I, but I feel, but I want, but I see it's what's here. Somebody this morning has got to cut the ropes and go for God and say, I'm going to listen to every message that's preached. Man, what has already been preached is enough for us to have revival and turn the world upside down. I cannot see and I cannot feel, Job said. I look to the right and I looked to the left, I looked in the forward, and I looked behind, but he knoweth the way that I take. And by faith, I surrender my life to him. We've been fed so much many times as second generation Christians growing up in Christian homes. We become complacent. It becomes a game. How many of you grew up in a Christian home, meaning you were not the first one in your home to get saved? Other people in your home were Christians. Maybe they weren't all the Christians that they should be, but you understand that term, second generation or third generation Christians. How many, like me and my, my children, how many of you would just stand up across the whole auditorium, upstairs and downstairs? Think about it for just a moment. Go ahead and stand. Somebody else in your family was already saved, your parents' generation, maybe a mom or maybe a dad or maybe a grandparent. Now, now look around the room. We've been given so much. But let me tell you something. I have a heart for you because I lived this day in and day out in one of the best, what I would call the best Christian homes in all of fundamentalism. Real parents. Great church. People that loved me and prayed for me. You can be seated. But there was a mentality that came along. A mentality that came that, that caused us without even knowing. You're not playing games on purpose. Caused us to play games with our father. The God that's real who's trying to speak to you, he's in the room right now. I contacted some of my uh, sisters and so, some of my family, and I said, we grew up in a Christian home. Man, they're living for God and, 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 and loving the Lord, and, and, and they're now, many of them trying to reach the next generation. I said, I want you to write down a few things uh, as well. And I had a list of 10 or 15 things, and we began to share and ask some other people uh, that are second, third generation Christians uh, what they struggled with or what they saw others struggle with. And here, here is what I believe that this group of people struggle with when it comes to knowing our Father and not playing games and making it real. I wrote these things down. First generation Christians. Christians see Jesus as preeminent. Second generation Christians see him as important. Please listen carefully and try to ask yourself questions as you hear this. First generation Christians see the Bible truths and promises as shocking, new, exciting, transformative, Brother Bruce. Wow, man, I'm so glad I'm saved. Second generation Christians see them as good, normal, routine. Hey, I'm glad we're doing the conference. What's the theme this year? Who is the Lord? Oh, that's great. I wonder what that means. And yet a new, new, new Christian's walking here. Oh, man, I'm glad I got the answer to that. Hey, hey, youth pastor, when can I get baptized? Hey, thank you. Will you pick me up on the bus on Sunday? Oh, yeah, who's the Lord? Oh, that's the God that everybody preaches about. Oh, it's good. It's great. And oftentimes just religious. First generation Christians have embraced cost. We as second generation Christians, we embrace comfort. It's youth activity on Saturday. Oh, yeah, they want us to go sewing. Yeah, 
Oh, I hope the bus is. Do we have an air-conditioned bus yet? We have not Chick-fil-A or In-N-Out this, this Wednesday. First generation Christians saw what they escaped. Second gen- generation Christians saw, wonder what they missed. Would I be preaching here today at the North Valley Youth Conference, Joseph Brown, if I didn't grow up in Larry Brown's home? And by the way, I wouldn't be in, unless I had a day that I answered that question and said, yes, Jesus saved me. He went to the cross for me. And all to Jesus, I have surrendered. We wonder, we wonder, would I be doing this? First generation Christians tried their faith. Second generation Christians theory their faith. First generation Christians hunger for more. Second generation Christians are weaned with just enough to get comfortably by. Parents give second generation, they give you just enough to fit in so you're not the bad kid in the youth group. You're not a true disciple of Jesus Christ, just a good kid because we've given you just enough. Just don't get kicked out of Christian school, that's all we ask. I thank God that that's not true of many, many people in the room, but it's a stereotype, if you will. First generation Christians are burdened for the lost. Why? Because they were completely lost and because they know so many lost. Second generation Christians are burdened by the lost. When I went to driver's ed and went to public school for the first time, I sat there alphabetically beside a beautiful girl. And man, I was hoping that they would pair us up in the car that you drive in with the driving instructor. And sure enough, they did. And the entire many weeks, I was so burdened. Why? Because I wanted to be cool. I wanted her to like me or notice me. I'm in public school. You know, I've been around uh, a Christian. I, I was homeschooled around Christian school and youth group. Uh, I, I wasn't, I wasn't uh, burdened for her soul. I was burdened by it. Pastors would be like, oh, I, I got to. Man, my dad. Going to ask me if I witnessed to whoever I was with today. I was burdened by them, but not for them. First generation Christians experience mercy firsthand. Second generation Christians bypass the mercy to only know of grace. And grace without mercy causes ingratitude. You have to drive through the neighborhood of mercy that I deserved hell, but was given grace. You have to drive through the neighborhood of mercy to arrive at the authentic destination of what grace is really all about. First generation Christians know what they received. It's hard to fool them. Second generation Christians are easily fooled. These are the people that mock the North Valley Baptist Church and others like it. They're all second generation Christians. You look at all the recovering fundamentalists of the world, and I'm not talking about one little group that's going to be happy that I mentioned their name. I'm talking about a movement of people that may not even know that one little group of people. They're all second generation Christians. And the only first generation Christians that follow them are the ones who their children have become that recovering, who've deceived their parents and drawn them into their apostasy. First generation Christians relive major defining moments in life when everything changed. Second generation Christians feel empty without major defining moments in their own life. They want, they want that newness. They want that growth. Let me just tell you something. God is real. Stay faithful to him. Stay listening. Stay surrendered. Do right. Repent of your hidden sin. Live for Jesus and you'll have revival. First generation Christians ask what else. If you want me to change mic, say well. Otherwise, I'm going to keep going. Hold it up like that. It's how I'm holding it. I got it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, First generation Christians carry a spirit of debt. Second generation Christians carry a spirit of spiritual entitlement and expectancy. And expectancy always ruins relationships even when it comes to Jesus Christ. God just doesn't feel real to me. How are you saying that? How am I saying that? God is just not close. He just doesn't answer my prayer. It's a spirit of expectancy. We don't deserve God to answer one of my prayers. I sit in that hotel room, that beautiful hotel, and I'm literally like a little kid. I'm like, I'm preaching with Pastor Swanson, the man that I was called to preach with. I'm almost done. I'm going to be done before 10. Stay with me quickly. First generation Christians have a spirit of urgency. Second generation Christians have a spirit of complacency. It's always been a part of my life. Why should I be in a hurry? First generation Christians focus on relationship. Second generation Christians focus on formula. First generation Christians, first love is a new love. Second generation Christians, first love is a recycled love. It's been taught us or given to us from somebody else instead of one day coming awake to the fact that Jesus loves me and he died for me and he saved me. They were playing games with their father. And because of that, they were playing games with revival God was on top of the mountain, Moses' face shone. What a picture of revival, Brother Cooper. (laughs) Oh, oh, Moses, he had a stubborn streak. He had it, man, he was flesh too. But he met with God and was revived. 
And when he came down that mountain, he threw the tables of stone down and broke them. Why? Because revival that was offered was denied. I went to a camp at 11th grade and realized, sitting in the back as you played watchman, after that message you preached, I realized I was playing games. I didn't think I was. I was there to sing. I was sitting in the back. I was in a camper, small little camp. I'd never met Brother Pastor Swanson before. In my 11th grade year, he got up to preach, and he poured his heart out, and he preached the word of God. And in that moment, I said, you know what? I'm, I'm playing games, and tonight, God, I'm going to change all my, all my wants, and I'm going to give my life to your wants. And I was called to preach that night. Sam Epley, one year later, my brother-in-law, he was called to preach. I heard a little quote, a little, little thing by Leonard Ravenhill, and it sounded just like you and your passion, your heart. That's going to be my invitation. It's about two minutes long. I want you to watch the screens and listen, and then I'm going to let Pastor Trooper come after this little video clip. And I remember that camp. Remember that camp as you poured your heart out. And I wonder if when God was offering revival to me, if I would have continued to play games in coldness, not having an ear to hear, hiding my sin, not willing to repent, not willing to say all to Jesus, I surrender God, I'm all in, I'm cutting the ropes and going for God, I wouldn't be standing here tonight. Take a look and ask God, am I playing games? I'm sick of theology and words. We need God to move in our midst. Oh, thou that dwellest between the cherubims, Lord, don't stay there. Come down here. The one thing that alarms me in America and England is that there is no alarm in the church. You say America needs God. No, she doesn't. The church needs God. If the church gets God, America will soon feel it. She'll be staggering. A preacher said something the other day that's very disturbing to an audience that he was addressing. He said, I want to tell you that if God withdrew the Holy Spirit from my church today, it would function tomorrow the same way we wouldn't even know he'd gone. And methinks that might be written of many churches in that we become so mechanical. We go in at 11 and come out at 12 and the Holy Ghost must come and we open the door of the church and he must leave when we lock it. And we try and lay down the track and say, come Holy Ghost, for thee we call spirit of burning, come, but come our way. We've laid down the conditions. Holy Ghost, come, but please don't violate our theology. Don't upset our status quo. Don't break our hearts over the lost world. Oh, yes, yes, preachers. You and I will raise our hats to Finney and Gould. And we raise our hats to the martyrs. And we thank God for the last drop of their blood. But we won't give him the first drop of ours. I can't live another day without the fire of God. Consuming me everything that's unchrist like consuming me everything which hinders surrender everything that's revival when you can't sit through the meeting you feel you've got a burning cancer if i don't get to the cross now i may die before the meeting's over every preacher who has lost the fire you should be on your face down here you used to burn but you got so busy with organizing the fire has gone out come on you can't patch up your prayer life when you get to the judgment seat. You can't sacrifice when you get to the judgment seat. You can't weep when you get to the judgment seat. It's all between here and there. Listen, if our God is a consuming fire, and He is, if He takes a residence in you, you'll burn till you die. God needs a torch of holy fire in your house. He wants a fire in you to read the Word of God to your family. He wants the fire of God, your neighbors will know. I can't live in coldness anymore. I can't live in blindness anymore. I can't be indifferent to a dying world. Yes. Glory. Glory to God, thank you, Father.